All right, go, go. Yeah, five, four, three. That's tomorrow, and that is it. That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today, and we will leave you with a... I can't do it. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Do it live! I can... I'll write it, and we'll do it live! Fucking thing sucks! That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks again for watching. We'll leave you with Sting and a cut off his new album. Take it away. I can stand up too. Think you're cool? Yeah. Think I can't do a stream Let's standing go. up, Jace? Hey, what's going on? It's your man Julito McCullough from HBO's The Wire. Some of the some people say it's the greatest TV show ever. But you are watching Fireside Chats with the homie Big Chief Burrito. Oh. Hi, I'm Nick Mangold, seven-time Pro Bowler, and you are listening to Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito. I appreciate your time, brother. Thank you very much for, for coming on the show today. The best of luck. What is up, everybody? It's your boy, Lou Martinez, a.k.a. Big Chief Burrito, live with you on a Thursday. Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito, live from Chula Vista, California, the Burrito Lounge. Special episode today. Uh, we're going to be talking poker with vlogger, uh, poker pro Andrew Nimi here in a moment. Um, he is part of a group of poker pros that are making a move to Austin, Texas, to the, uh, what is it, the Poker Boom 3.0 with texas <clears throat> you know texas hold them and whatnot uh they're buying a piece of the loge card room in austin texas and i've been following andrew for a long time uh his blogs um his you know sort of life blogs i have a theory he's a frustrated filmmaker we're going to talk about that uh but um he hit i hit him up uh took shot my shot as they say and uh surprisingly the dude's super humble super nice uh, and he agreed to come on uh, and talk poker, talk life with me. So let's get right into it. Bring on Mr. Andrew Nimi to the stream. What's up, my man? The uh, <laughs> the burrito lounge, two of my favorite things: burritos and lounging. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I had to I pick like a like a silly name for my production company, and you know, um, burritos at two in the morning are a San Diego, California thing. Uh, so, you know, you know what, what, what's the go-to 2 a.m. food in Las Vegas? Uh, we have, we have Tacos El Gordo. Um, uh, that's okay. open late. Have you, have you been in that spot? Yeah. Tacos. I mean, Tacos El Gordo is from TJ's from right here originally. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that's about as authentic, I think, as you can maybe find in, uh, in Vegas, at least on the strip. Um, so that's definitely a good spot. Um, probably one of the favorites for sure. 
Excellent, excellent. Um, well, like I said, thank you it, for for coming on today. Um, obviously, the main the main thing that I wanted to, that that I thought was super interesting is that you guys um, have been creating content for years. You're you know regarded as one of the OG uh, poker bloggers, and now you guys are making a move to a physical space. Um, what what's the thought process for you when that become when that's something that gets presented to you? You know, because obviously that's a huge lifestyle change in terms of I'm assuming waking up late. Because I know some of your blogs are like, "Hey, I left the Bellagio at ten in the morning," and 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 stuff like that. So, um, what's that? What's the main thing that? What was the genesis of that, that idea, and and how did you begin that process of kind of realizing that it's something that you wanted to do? Yeah, it's kind of a long story. Um, so my my co-host for events that uh, that we've been that we've been running and hosting, um, a guy by the name of Brad Owen. Uh, he's also a fellow a fellow YouTuber uh, that makes poker videos very similar to mine in a lot of ways. Um, we've been we've been hosting these events called that we call Meetup Games, where it's basically the idea is for people that like to watch these poker vlogs and also play poker in their spare time, uh, try and get a bunch of these folks together for a little bit more uh, fun of the poker night. Because a lot of times when you look in a, in a poker room in a casino, it, it's it's pretty quiet in there. Um, it can be a little bit intimidating, and uh, we wanted to try and do something a little bit different out there in the, in the poker streets. So we came up with an idea to just host these like fun, casual poker nights where um, we're going to be vlogging. People can uh, partake in the videos, try and uh, try and get into the videos and play hands with us. And there's often like you know some beverages that are had along the way, maybe a little bit more than average in your uh, in your average poker night. So um, oh, for a long time, you know. We've been hosting these events for a few years and uh for a long time there we thought it would be cool if you know we're going to all these other card rooms and uh casinos around the country what if we had our own spot where we could uh we could bring people to and all that all that promotional and uh, marketing work would sort of point inward and we could have a say in uh, how the room is ran and, and all those sorts of things um so of course that's like miles easier said than done um, the I landscape. You, I, no, I know you said Doug poked at a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of like you know being a spear. I was watching your pod with him and and, and Brad the other day. So okay, like, yeah. So so he, he's the one that brings the idea. You guys kind of think that that it's something that that could help bring your your production to the next level, right? Yeah. So he had moved to he had moved to Austin, Texas. Uh, I don't know, maybe about a year ago or so now, and uh, he came to us with. A very similar idea that, that we had been having, you know, all along the way, and was like, "What if we partner up and uh, and launch a room of, of our own?" And so he put out the feelers a little bit in the Austin market and uh, heard back from uh, a few different rooms, but one of them was the the existing room that is like the biggest and and uh, the one that people seem to enjoy the most these days, which is called the Lodge in Austin. And uh, of course, you know, we can definitely handle the uh, the content creation around around a poker room, um, but. Even amongst the three of us, there's zero experience in terms of running a place, right. running a brick and mortar operation. So it definitely like made more sense, made way more sense to partner up with the existing room there, leave the management in place that's that's been there all along, and uh, sort of build out this team where you know everyone brings a little something to the table. Absolutely, uh, Michael has a question here. Uh, are you leaving? Leave, are you leaving? Leaving or just spanning out? Home base will be Austin. Yeah, so uh, home base will still be in Vegas, um, at least at least for the time being. Um, the plan is to go out there once a month. I, I imagine I'll probably be there for anywhere from three days to a week each time I go out there. Um, but yeah, I'll be I'll be out there pretty regularly. That'll be like the most regular sort of meetup game thing that we'll be doing these days. Right. And uh, just staying in Vegas for right now. Vegas is very uh, very convenient and uh, and sort of tough to leave a lot of conveniences that are in Las Vegas. Would you say it's a very favorable place to live? Uh, yeah, I guess I would. I guess I would say that. Yeah, I'd be a little bit more more on brand. Um, in terms of the vlogging, you know, because uh, I have some technical questions, but was there any um, like ethical dilemma in your mind about? I mean, I know you're going to places, and you're you're you know you've said it that you know you ask for forgiveness, not permission, when you start recording. Um, but it. it was is there any uh, like any ethical dilemma that plays out in your mind in terms of like I'm going to create content at my own club? It's going to be my home base. We're going to have meetup games here. Does that ever do? You, do you have to sort of, or do you feel that that as long as everything's transparent, you know, 
by the by stuff like that that you don't that you don't think that you have to have that sort of dilemma about sort of I don't know do you maybe a perception of you having an advantage doing those at home uh, at your home base as opposed to like at a neutral site as far as as far as creating content yeah as far as creating content maybe even the meetup games uh no i've never really i've never really found much of an ethical dilemma with with any of it so like if 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 you're referring to the filming then i mean for for the longest time for some reason uh you know i mean I, it's it stems from d a different era i think but like for the for the longest time casino gaming and gambling sort of ha has this real like seedy sort of underworld feel to it and I'm not really sure why that would be the case these days, because the games are run in uh, a very public setting. Anybody, as long as they have a buy-in, can come and sit and play. And these games are run by public, uh, publicly traded corporations, and it's it's anything but those uh, those descriptors. Right. There's the no. There's no. There's no backroom crazy Russian mobster. None of that. Yeah. None of the, even. You, you know. You saw that movie. I'm sure you saw that movie. Uh, Twenty One, where it's about the blackjack card counters. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even that was like way sensationalized where they take them in the back room and, you know, give them a beating, you know, there's none of that stuff. They might, they might intimidate, uh, you know, advantage players a little bit, um, and say, you know, your action isn't welcome here, but there's no, like, there's, there's none of that sort of thing happening, uh, beating people up and all that stuff. And so I just, I feel like, you know, I don't really see why, uh, poker in particular, it's a competitive game. It's, you know, there's gambling elements to it, of course, but it's a skill game. And so I don't really see why it needs to be something that's like so so hidden and a forbidden game, and so it's something that needs to exist in the shadows. Um, even still, with my content, I still you know blur out faces, and you know I don't want someone to like see them and see themselves in a video and be like, oh man, I feel so stupid that I played a hand that way. So I, I remove everyone's um, uh, likeness from the videos anyway. Um, but you know, these are. I don't think it's I don't think it's the same kind of a setting that it was in the past. Um, okay. and so I don't think it's something that needs to be all all secretive. Uh, as far as like having an advantage or anything, um, you know, there's the when we have the meetup games, it's I mentioned the beverages. We're definitely like partaking. We're splashing right. around. Um, it's not that serious <clears throat> of a game. It's it's, it's double meant board to be bomb pots. Huh? Double board bomb pots. Yeah, there's there's like that, there's games. things that are sort of built into the game to create more action. And I'm I'm vlogging, I'm having drinks, I'm hanging out with people, I'm chatting. So of course I'm gonna be better than like some people that show up to the games, but I'm also like trying to entertain and like play a lot more hands than I might usually. And uh, you know, there's there's some give and take there for sure. So you gave yourself like a four beer handicap? <laughs> I don't think that's that bad of an idea in some, in some games, you know. I th I've heard of stuff like that. I've heard of pros like being uh, forced to have a have a minimum uh, a drink minimum before they're allowed to play in like oh. in like home games and stuff. Do you get spewy when you get a little buzzed or? Yes, a, a little spewy. Oh, it's spewy. really hard to fold when you're when you're drinking. From the logistical standpoint of of creating poker vlogs, do you have to work on? like physical movements that you do for your blog becoming tells like, or do you currently have, do you have your camera, do you, do you turn your camera on only for specific hands that you want to record? And does that give off a tell to other players or do you constantly have it running or do you have to like uh, deviate and like turn on your camera for like eight deuce offsuit a couple of times to, to keep them guessing? Yeah, that's, that's a interesting guess. And it's kind of intuitive. Um, but no, I mean, the thing is that like, if you're a good poker player, then you're going to be playing what's called like a balanced range. So, you know, when you come into the pot, you, the, hopefully your opponent isn't going to know whether you have aces or you have eight, seven suited, you know? So I do just record hands that I'm getting involved in. So like if I'm going to play a, a hand preflop, I'll, I'll fire up the video and, uh, and set the camera up against my chips and start recording. Um, the thing is like, A, most people aren't really paying that keen of attention. Um, they're usually sort of preoccupied with what they're up to. Like they're, they're trying to figure out what their best course of action is in the hands. And, uh, B it's like, yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to play like good poker. So at any one time, nobody's really going to know, or hopefully not going to know whether I have a value hand or a bluffing hand. 
you gotta you gotta you gotta balance that you gotta like fumble with your camera like, oh and then you know for <laughs> there sure. is that you know you know because like, a lot of people take take photos on instagram of their of their good hands and stuff and so we say you got to balance the uh the instagram uh range and take take a picture of seven deuce offsuit once in a while when you um when you what do you get a lot of i mean old man coffee or other maybe like grizzled european players or something like that do do you ever get any like uh feedback or crap from them and you know like hey this this guy's or do you get like um, you know i wear my dead money hat when i go play poker so people think i'm dead money uh but do you ever do do you, do you think people obviously if they're fans of the vlog they want those those neem bucks or bradley bucks or or, or what have you, you know they want they want that money but uh, do you feel that they they play with you a different way because because they think they know how you play? Maybe. Um, I think I think what happens other times that's more interesting is that people might get more out of line sometimes just because they want to either like get one over on me or the other poker bloggers, or you know, they want to win some of those dollars or try and make it into a video. Um, so sometimes people, you know, be playing hands that they probably shouldn't. And that definitely happens to some degree. Um, the thing is that it's kind of tough. It's tougher when like someone's being more aggressive towards you rather than passive. So you'd, you'd much rather play against a calling station rather than someone who's like forcing you to a decision. Um, so that comes up sometimes. And the thing is like, you, there's a lot of times where you never really know until after the fact, you know, like say you make the, like, the correct call or whatever. And they'll say like, oh, I, just, I just wanted to bluff you. You know, I just want to try and get you. <clears throat> but at the time you don't really know like what they're up to. It's not like they're saying that out loud in the moment in the middle of their hand. Uh, I call, I hero called Andrew Nimi with ace high, you know, or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah, or I bluffed him, I bluffed him in queen deuce, ha ha ha, put that in your yeah. vlog. <laughs> yeah, that definitely happens, but there's other times where, like, I think someone's up to something, I make a call, and, oh, they have a full house, you know, it's like, so you never really know until after the end. Can say from experience, Brad and Andrew said, my time will meet up and had a multi-beer handicap yesterday, we're fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. Uh, I, I when I be, when I became I think I started watching Doug's videos, uh, poker hands video, uh, poker hands videos uh, first, and then that drew me to you. And then I started seeing the meetup games that Brad was posting. And when I started to like go back and like binge those videos because I was like, oh, this is cool. I noticed that you had been at Sevens in in Chula Vista, but like two months earlier or something like that. I was like, oh, I just missed my chance to, to cause that's literally like down the street for me. Um, yeah. Any, any, any chance you get back uh, uh, down to the, the, the Southern California area lower than LA at some point? Yeah, it's great down there. That's a, that's a really sharp room. Um, you know, it's interesting cause I think it's the same ownership group as the one that owns Stones Casino in Sacramento. Okay. And they've, they've become a little kind of, uh, they're oh, doing some, wow, nefarious, yeah. some nefarious things went down there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a sharp run. It's not real. It's not a real big room. So they don't get a ton of games. Um, so I know sometimes there's like some long wait list to get into like a, like a five ten yeah. game or something. There might just be one table going. Um, but yeah, I really like it down there. It'd be great to have some sort of, uh, you know, a meetup game down there. There's a couple of different options. There's that humble place. I think, is that how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I dig it. I dig it down there for sure. Yeah, you can find me getting owned at the 48 Omaha High Low table when you when you when you stop by there. That's, that's uh, your jam, Omaha. <laughs> well, you know, like I told you, uh, be, like before when I talked to you, I've been I didn't have a chance to not be a poker degenerate because ever since I grew up as a kid, my dad would sit me right next to him at the poker table at, e at either at the casino or at shady ass poker clubs in New York. And I would sit there and he would show me his hand and I would sit there and watch it. And I was, from the time I was six, seven years old, I was watching poker hands, looking at people. And it wasn't only, it was only, it wasn't really Texas Hold'em. It was honestly, at that point, they were playing like short deck. They would play short deck in these clubs. Really? Yeah. Or Omaha high low at the casinos and stuff like that. So, so when you were a kid and you were, uh, and you were seeing these scenes, did you find it like interesting and intriguing or are you like, Oh, what is dad bringing me to today? Well, my dad used to take me out of school. He used to call, call the school, make up a relative that died or something, or say I had a doctor's appointment, pick me up at school at like 1130 in the morning in Queens, New York. And the reason he was picking me up is because he knew he wasn't going to be able to be back by 330 to pick me up. And then we'd be at Belmont, the racetrack at noon 
And I'd, and I'd sit there with a bunch of 60-year-old grizzled dudes at the, at the racetrack, and they'd be talking about gambling and stuff like that. I was 13, and they would let me place bets because they knew me so much. Um, but, wow. at the, but, but you always have that thing where if your parents think something's cool, you think it's not cool. Yeah. So, so I tolerated it, and then and then I'd be playing heads up against like this this dude. He's like, "Come here, kid. I'm, I'm a teacher." And then I'd sit there and play heads up with them or Jim Runny or something like that. So, so for me, when I was like 18, 19, 21, I was like, "Let's get to the casinos. Let's get after it." It was it was yeah. bred in me since I was a kid. So yeah, the um, so. But yeah, so so I never I never I never had a chance to not to not go down that path. Yeah, um, like, that's pretty different from my uh, from my upbringing. Like my dad would play poker with his friends once in a while, um, but there wasn't really like that much gambling going on around uh, around home. Like even if like you know sports betting is so big all over the country. Um, never really nobody in my family was really into that either. So I didn't really get into the poker at all until I was uh, like 20, 24. So you were you started off um, music industry, uh, just kind of regular job. Uh, you're originally from Michigan, right? Yeah. Um, um, and then and then and then I know you sort of started seeing the possibilities of poker, but um, so you and, and this was around like the initial poker boom, right? Yeah, that was uh, so. I, I was I was working in London for a music promotion company, and I came back, and my my little brother Jonathan, he was. Uh, he was he he had like downloaded a couple of the, the online poker clients and was just playing play money for fun, and uh, so I checked that I checked it out. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. You're actually playing against other people. It's kind of it's kind of fun. The uh, software it, it works, and uh, you get to play poker against people. Um, and then I moved out to LA to continue this music thing, and started uh, checking out the real money sites. I was like, yeah, this is actually pretty fun. And poker was everywhere back then. You know, this was like in the, in the thick of it. So we're talking about like 20, 2005. And uh, it was also like very soft. So you're playing against like the complete global player pool and uh, much easier times. And it's also just like everywhere, all over television. So yeah, I, I, I chased the uh, the music industry thing for a few years, but uh, got a little bit jaded over that. And at the same time, poker was just blasting off. So one was one was slowing down and the other was uh, not slowing down. It was going the opposite way. If there's an industry shadier than poker, then it might be the music industry, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, uh, question for Andrew here from Michael again. Uh, in what city do you find the highest level of play, the easiest? I think Vegas is generally the toughest uh, games on average. Um, so, of course, there's, it's always going to vary, like, lineup to lineup. Um, you know, you can, you can end up in, like, the, you can easily end up in, like, the best poker game going anywhere in the world and also the toughest poker game going anywhere in the world in Las Vegas, possibly on the same night. Um, but I think there's so many professionals that um, move to Vegas for like the Vegas lifestyle and just like the number of games and casinos to choose from and the low rake that it makes for uh, some pretty tough games. And even the, like the locals, they also sort of know that like they just have to play a patient style versus the tourists that are on uh, unlimited time and want action. So the games, for those reasons, can be can be pretty tough. Um, and then, uh, yeah, not to like just just try and promote our thing or whatever, but obviously, like Texas is up there for for the best action. Um, for me, I think it's like I think it's uh, I think it's close between Texas and Southern California. Um, you want to have you want to have a market where there's a lot of people that have a lot of money, and uh, those those boxes are both checked in, in Texas and Southern California for sure. All right, and we're talking with Andrew Nimi here, a newly minted uh, partner at the Loge Poker Club. Lodge. You can go to the Loge Poker Club. The the lot. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I don't know why I keep saying Loge. The, I'm thinking we're sitting in in, in, a, in a in a baseball stadium somewhere. Yeah, where you guys are in the Loge. No, the Lodge <laughs> <clears throat> Poker Club, po a card club, right? It's it's uh well, it's the the Lodge po Poker Club, but it's called technically it's called the Card Club, right? Um. Yeah. And you have a lineup of events here that's happening, uh, big monster stack things. It's 24 hours. And it's and, and I guess the the setup in, in Texas is you um, you you join the club as a member. Uh, you pay you pay a membership fee, et cetera. And then you also pay for the hours that you play. Right. But there's usually an agreement at the table as to who pays what. Uh, so there's no rake that comes off the table. That's that's how the uh, the laws are set up. Like the the card rooms, they can't have an interest in in the running of the game. So so no money ever comes off the table. Um, 
And yeah, so there's no there's no rake that's dropped uh, out of the pots like there are in, in casinos. Um, so there's it's just set up as a membership club, and uh, and that's the business model. All right. And um, I had a question about this, but Vicky asked, "Will you design a separate room for the live stream table like the Hustler?" Um, I've seen the the lodge uh, stream. I've, I'm also subscribed to that. Do you have a? Uh, do you guys? Are you guys gonna like? mix in there get in there and tweak them or you guys kind of kind of let them keep doing like what they're doing we want to do a mix of both of those things um they've like they've done such an awesome job like a with the branding with the the lodge theme and that stuff um and and, and b with running it and uh they weren't they weren't first to market but they uh they did such a good job that it's it's become like the the premier place to play down there so we definitely want to continue to allow them to just do their thing and we want to just shine as, as much of a spotlight on it as we can. Um, so yeah, if there's, we'll definitely like take a look at, uh, some things here and there and see if we can, um, you know, what, what improvements that, uh, they think they might need and, uh, and go from there. I don't know about like a separate room for the uh, live stream, but definitely like considering options that are, that are on the table and seeing what, seeing what people like about other uh, streams and all that stuff. One of the things that I noticed that sort of, I think, because you watch so much poker you sort of drown it out but sometimes but sometimes on a lot of a lot of these poker tv shows the incessant sound of chips yeah. being 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 shuffled non-stop is 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 one of like i think i mean it's awesome to see people playing live it's awesome to see people you love playing live you love seeing these big five thousand ten thousand dollar pots uh you know and then the commentary you know it's usually fucking on point but the is there a universe where people on the stream can be convinced to shuffle their chips less or is there a way to dampen that noise so that when you're watching a stream it's just like <laughs> like non-stop it's a funny question like because i as a poker player i'm so used to that sound that i don't even notice it anymore like when i turn on a stream i don't notice it but my wife will for sure point that out like anytime we turn on the stream or, or whatever. And uh, also if you, I don't know if, if, I assume you've been to the uh, the WSOP, right? In Vegas? Yes. Yeah. Like if you go in there, they, they're, they're moving it from the Rio uh, this coming summertime. But yeah, like if you go in there, it's like, it's just this gigantic cavernous room of people shuffling chips and it's crazy. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know. I think you probably have to like incentivize them somehow. Either that or, or or like manufactured chips that don't sound like that. <laughs> stuff well. uh, I'd have to think about that one for a bit. But we do want to do like we we'll we want to make sure that uh, everything is professional sounding and, and looking as possible. So I don't know if that I don't know if that means like adjusting the mics so that they mainly only pick up uh, voices uh, or or what. You know, I, I'm not I'm not sure to be honest, but definitely Vel definitely worth considering. Uh, velvet chips. There you go. Or or Maybe. just straight straight cash, <laughs> just, just get after it. It's a little uh, shuffling cash. I don't buy it. <clears throat> I mean, for the for the grizzled veterans, poker fanatics that that are used to it. Like you said, if you've been in any WSOP or in any casino, any large tournament field, it's just an incessant. You 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 you're pretty much. It's like crickets unless you somebody points out, hey, there's a, that, there's a cricket making noise. You're like, oh, I didn't even. It didn't even register, you know, but yeah. for more casuals, I would, I would think it's something that when they're trying to watch a live stream that they might be like, why do I, I mean, but, <laughs> yeah. I don't, but That's some a good point. yeah, I mean, we have to, we definitely want to consider the, uh, the casual viewer and try and bring in more people rather than just trying to recycle the same audience over and over again. So we definitely want to like consider the, uh, the viewpoint of people that are new to poker and not just like immediately disregard how they might view things or, or hear things i guess in this instance yeah, maybe you need like an expert stream and then like a beginner stream where the, the person is like okay <laughs> see three pairs not a thing ladies and gentlemen three pairs not a thing all right um <laughs> what uh i've seen um i've seen casinos where they try to they say that if you break a stack it's considered action so they don't let, and this was for a tournament, and they don't let because they they had such a pe problem with people picking up their chips and moving them all around and like doing weird motions and stuff that 
when you're playing a hand, if you break a if you break your stack, that means you're calling or raising or something. And I think that's that's meant more to prevent people from like moving their chips and stuff like that. But I don't know if there's a way to 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 incentivize poker players unless, like you said, Borgata has chips that are hard to shuffle. Okay, that might that might work. Awkward chips. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that <laughs> in some California casinos too. Um where it's yeah, it's like I don't know if they're plastic chips or what, but yeah, they, they're definitely harder to shuffle. And maybe they're quieter too. Like uh, I know the bike and I think commerce uses these plastic chips and they, they probably make less noise when you shuffle them. Plastic chips make it feel so weird though. It feels like you're yeah, playing with like not, a six year old. It, feels little, it just feels cheaper. It doesn't have a, a good of a feel to it. So if we if we go yeah. for the silent chips, it might it might turn some yeah. people off in a different way. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. No, don't no, no, don't don't make that the basis of any major changes, number one. But that, that's just a, a thought that I had in my head. Um, did you ever have casinos or poker rooms that that denied you the ability to to film or you know or or to do your thing, come back to you later on once they realized what a mistake that was? Um, in terms of promotions and getting more people interested in their rooms, probably not like in those terms, but sort of, you know, like there's definitely been a couple of casinos in Vegas where, um, like particularly the Bellagio and the Aria, um, they've sort of like just come around to it. You know, um, there's a guy named Sean who runs the room at Aria and he's definitely, I would say essentially done like a 180 on it. And I wouldn't say that it's just open season now because he, he said that like, you know, if someone wants to do this vlogging thing, come, come chat, with, come chat with me, give me a heads up on it and we'll, uh, we'll see about getting it done. Um, and then they have like a sign, you know, the, the sign where it's like, there's filming in this area constitutes your awareness of it. This, you know, the sign does, and then we can use your likeness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it's not like they're saying, uh, it's not like they're saying, Andrew, you should definitely come and do this thing here. And like, here's, here's some incentives for you to come do it. But they're also being like, you know, a little bit more cool or a lot more cool about it than they were. Uh, I would say the win is probably still the toughest about it. They're just, they just seem like they're the most protective over their brand. Um, and, you know, like when we're doing this poker logging thing, we're just, we're capturing it all ourselves. We're editing it ourselves and not giving them the, uh, uh, g giving them a look before we upload it. Um, so they want to be a little bit more protective about it. It seems like than than some other rooms that are more trusting of us at this point, you know, we've been doing this for five years now. You think they would, uh, they would kind of see that, like, we're not just yeah. trying to drag them or we're not, we're not trying to like show, um, yeah. uh, shenanigans. We're not trying to show like a fight that goes down or something like that. We're trying to like work together here and, and show like poker is like I was saying, like not this backroom shady thing anymore. It's like pretty kind of respectable competition thing here. So transparency, you're trying, you're, you're being completely transparent about what's happening. You guys are showing your wins, but you're also showing your losses. You and Brad, particularly, you guys will drop 10, 15 grand at Bellagio and then say, and I came to have a beer and a slice of pizza at this place right at the Bellagio. It's beautiful. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, you're not, <laughs> yeah. you're not being like, ah, fucking Bellagio, Bellagio dealers are the worst, you know, or something yeah. like that. Or like you guys, I don't, you know, I, I think it just has, um, there's a lot of leftover old school sort of thought process on that. Yeah, they, the casino industry is very slow moving with that stuff. Um, they they do they try to be really protective of a their own uh, their own image and branding, and then b um, you know they don't want to have people be shied away from from showing up at the place if they know that there's you know broadcasting of of their customers or whatever. So on one hand, I can totally get it, but on on the other hand, it's like it's such it's such a good marketing tool for them. Um, you know, Brad and I, especially, we're we're reaching out to you know hundreds of thousands of of poker playing uh, fans. You know, and uh, it's some of the best marketing that they can find because it doesn't come from them. You know, it comes from yeah. people that are disassociated with the company and that have built this trust factor with their audience. So it's different from like an ad. You know, that they buy that usually comes off as an ad. You know, it's it's something different than that, and it's. I don't know. Of course, I'm a little biased, but I think it's some of the best yeah, marketing no. that they could ask for. And 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 if they get ten players that come in because they watch one of you one of your vlogs, you know, seven of them are new to the game. You know, I see on 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 Brad's uh, videos a lot of the time where he'll meet players that came to Bellagio because they were hoping to get to play with him or you that were there. And this is yeah. fresh blood, fresh money. You know, uh, y y new new players to the game that. Yeah 
in theory, are good for their regs, right? For sure. Uh, no, no arguments here. But yeah, there's, it's cool. There's often a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of times where people will show up at the Bellagio and be like, "Hey, is uh, is Brad here? Is is Brad playing today? Have you seen him around?" So that's always that's always pretty funny when we hear about that. We, the uh, the guys up at the podium will tell us uh, there were some people here earlier asking for you, and it's cool. It's cool to see like the enthusiasm for this kind of content. Um, and then I had one other question regarding the actual process of your vlog. And it, it, do you ever? Um become distracted uh to the point or more focus on on the mechanics and logistics of, of of blogging and capturing good hands that it takes you off your game or uh, after year five is it just second nature to you it can be a lot um i think in no limit i'm i'm sort it's sort of second nature in in a pot limit omaha it's definitely tougher just with more cards going on and and it's a i'm, I'm not as experienced in the game um, there's just a lot more going on in PLO, so it's definitely tougher in, in the four-card game. Um, but I sort of view myself as, as more of a content creator than a poker player anyway. So, you know, the, whatever's gonna, whatever happens in the poker is just kind of what happens. And I'm, I'm more focused, especially, like, doing everything on my own. Um, although you know that I'm trying to, like, not do everything on my own uh, right. going forward. But And we can talk about that. But... Um, you know, especially doing everything on your own, it's so much energy to to put into this thing that you just can't expect to like be the you know like one of the best poker players because that in its own takes up so much energy. So uh, I've I've decided to like just be more of a content creator than a poker player, and uh, and just be okay with the fact that I'm going to be giving up some edge by by doing this this pursuit. Um, how much confidence do you have to have? Because I know you guys have been editing your own videos for years, and 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 I know from checking out your visual style that you are very peculiar about the shots that you use for transitions, intros, etc. I went back and I watched your first vlog, uh, <laughs> and uh, just I mean, as a filmmaker, this is a very, especially this this next shot coming up. This is a very well compositioned set up shot with the reflection and the time lapse here yep. like i still and then you got the whole video of you setting up the camera like I, the first thing that came to my mind and i was like andrew is a frustrated filmmaker in disguise because you take a <laughs> you take a lot of care in setting that up um so no i mean so props to you for that number one <laughs> thanks man it means a lot that it's when someone uh, notices and recognizes these things it's really cool because those that's the kind of stuff that i genuinely like um i i tend to put a little bit more, or a lot more uh energy or and you know a lot of a lot of the guys they, they like to focus on the poker hands and it definitely benefits their channel to do so um but yeah i i enjoy the uh the creative uh visuals and all that stuff no yeah that that, that was the because i i was looking back and i was like yeah andrew's really like he's 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 into his shot he's into his drones as someone who edits and who you know when i edit a video I, i'm editing a music video right now and and you i make a cut at minute three but i have to watch it back from the beginning to see how that cut feels with the rest of the video and sometimes you you edit something and you make a mistake or you slide something and then all of a sudden you play it back and the music just hits the right moment and you're like that's good that's good right there so i feel like you get you get not i don't say you get off on it but that's probably something that that that's that, that you like doing is matching those moments with music and, and visuals, you know? You're, you're speaking my language, Mr. Brady. <laughs> that's storytelling 101. That's, that's filmmaking 101. Yeah, um, man, I love, I love all that stuff. Like, like picking the music, finding, finding a track that just fits with the mood. Uh, like sometimes I'll spend like just an hour, you know, like going through SoundCloud. I've, I've used maybe like five or six uh, musical artists mainly. And um, they got like a pretty big library uh, between those guys and one girl on uh, on SoundCloud. So yeah, I'll be like just cruising through the music and like just thinking about the, the blog and like um, trying to find a track that fits the mood and then yeah, lining it all up and syncing it for, for when the beat drops just at the right moment. And then uh, yeah, all the, all the other stuff, making sure the video flows the way I want it to, uh, the, the pace of it all. Um, is this is this time lapse too long? Is this drone sequence too short? Can I Can I stick a little bit more in here? Um, all that stuff can, is, is much can I get a little? Can I fit my desert sunset drone shot here? Yeah, all that good stuff. Yeah, I'm a sucker. <laughs> I'm a sucker for the drone sequence for sure. 
Um, we have another question here for Ron S. Uh, what is allowed, not allowed these days with regards to recording hands at the table? Didn't Aria director make a point on Twitter to say it should be is illegal? Yeah, so we were just talking about that a little bit. He's sort of uh, done a little bit of a 180. Not, uh, I wouldn't say like completely just everyone have at it. He's basically said, if you want to do this, we can figure out a way to make it happen. Come see me. We'll, we'll put the sign out and we'll find a table for you to make it happen. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely... Uh, he just want to be a little. He's he's always seen the value of it, you know. But he work again. He works for like a, a public corporation where they have their rules in place and they have to like run it up the chain if there's going to be a change in in operations and and stuff like that. So he's always he's always dug it personally, but he also has to like balance that with uh, what the uh, MGM corporation wants. Do you sense? Do you get a sense? Because obviously, I mean, it's well established that poker is one of the games that brings the least amount of money to casinos, right? They can make, yeah, to get rid of all the poker tables, they put in a thousand slot machines. Their profits are going to go up, right? So, do you feel that? I mean, I know Planet Hollywood got rid of their room. Some other play, tape places have gotten rid of their rooms. Um, do you feel that there's some of that there where they, they're like, yeah, we should have poker for the feel and to get some cool people walking through and maybe for tournaments and bloggers, but it's not making us that much cash. Yeah. You know, it's tough. It's tough to like really know, um, what all of those numbers look like without, you know, being in the accounting department. Um, but so there's, it's definitely like in terms, in terms of, you know, it might be a little bit short term thinking, but in terms of like comparing it game to game, poker definitely is a much smaller revenue driver than any casino game. So if you look at it just comparatively like that, then, yeah, poker might not make sense for the the, the square footage that it takes up. But, um, you know, you definitely want to like start to think about, well, if these if this number of players are coming on property to, to come play poker, are they going to be spending you know, ancillary dollars and other parts of the casino that they might not have found their way to here without the poker room being here. Um, are they going to want to go to these restaurants after they play poker or before they play poker? Are they going to find their way to the craps table after playing poker? Um, so, you know, it's a little bit tougher to discern those sorts of things. You can just, when you just compare the poker rooms to the slot machines, you can look at the number in one column and look at the other column and say, we need this space for more slot machines. But, you know, you're chopping out some percentage of players that want to come and have their 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 evening, their full day and evening or weekend or whatever, which includes yeah, poker. And maybe they'll, they'll end up at the win rather than like the, the Planet Hollywood resort if there's no poker room at Planet Hollywood. Yeah. And plus, they, they could bring their partner, wife, boyfriend, uh, their, their their family. They could, you know, that might be blowing three, four, five hundred bucks at slot or at blackjack while you know while they're playing poker too. They, you know, it feels a little bit short sighted. I think there's also a prestige to having a good poker room. It just kind of brings back and evokes like old Vegas, you know? Yeah. And 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 so there's got to be some sort of prestige, like Q rating sort of favorable thing there for for them to uh to to keep that going. Uh we're talking live with Andrew Nimi, OG poker blogger, poker pro, uh new owner of the Lodge. Uh, poker club in Austin, Texas. Uh, they'll be out there the whole month of January with a bunch of special games here. Um, I want to give a shout out to everybody that's that's joined us. Uh, my name is Lou Martinez. I am a podcaster, filmmaker. You can follow me on facebook.com slash 2am burrito, twitch.tv slash 2am burrito, or youtube.com slash 2am burrito. I do interviews called Fireside Chats with people of all sorts. Uh, I got lucky and got Andrew and we're talking about poker, but we do interviews. And then you can always go to 2am burrito.com and find all our old films, uh, content, video sketches, and what have you. I uh, also want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Mestizo Coffee. Uh, Mestizo Coffee is single or origin, organic, uh, Latinx-owned coffee company, and uh, they make a ton of different flavors, uh, single origin, organic coffee. Uh, you can get uh, Route 66 Neon Chocolate. They all have cool names, cool flavors, Fruit Bomb. This is the one I'm drinking right now, the Tonic 420 and one Colombian single origin coffee. If you go to Mestizo, M-E-S-T-I-Z-O dot coffee, uh, any order that you make, put in the code Big Chief. Big Chief, and you'll get 10% off, and that includes uh, coffee and merch. There's also merch, coffee stuff, all kinds of good stuff. And if you get tired of that, then you can always go to Andrew's page for the favorable apparel. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that guy right there. <laughs> Model. 
Uh, the favorable hoodie, unfortunately, not available in three X right now. All right, uh, the, <laughs> we gotta so, get restocked for you. <laughs> when, when when those get when those go back, I want one. I might just I might just have to get the knit hat for now because it does get cold in the this casino. Nice. I'm got him rocking it right now. It's yeah, he's, rock, he's, right he's, he's he's rocking it right now. Um, so make sure that you guys give a like on the stream, follow, ask a question, hang out in the chat. Appreciate all the collaboration and the people are tuning in. I want to talk a little bit about home games. Um. Because I've I, I've been in the same home game for the last like fifteen years, um, and it took me probably about twelve of those years to get them to start playing like the seven deuce game, or occasionally doing like a six street, uh, just you know stuff that I know that like you know in the dealer home games and pro home games they play a lot of more like you know advanced different types of of games and stuff like that. What are home games like for like? poker pros in vegas do you guys just like not sit does that ever happen or or do you guys just so jaded and so pro that there's never like like there's never like a feel like that so it's definitely become more of a thing in recent years um there's also like this sort of odd shift that's going on right now where there's been private games being run in casinos uh in poker rooms in casinos which for a long time the longest time uh it was just generally considered to be an illegal thing like you can't you can't uh uh turn anyone away from a, a game that's run in a public casino but they figured they've somehow figured out a way and i don't have i personally don't have a ton of experience or any real experience with it um, but they've somehow figured out a way to run the list the game list the players list to only a, a include the players that they want in the game uh so like if some if one of those players leaves it's not just like open seat they sort of like go down the list of players and even if like there's no more list they still just like pull out a chair if they don't want another professional in there and it's now it's just a little shorter of a game so there's a lot of stuff like that that's going on and uh it's it's kind of just like um just due to the fact that games are generally getting a little bit tougher um especially in a place like las vegas um just you know talked a little bit about that before how it's, there's a lot of tough games there especially as you go up in stakes like two five and below it's it's totally fine um, even 510 games, I think, are the, the economy is still pretty good in Vegas. Um, once you start to go above that, though, it's like it's pretty tough to find a good public game. So there is there are um, there are private games in Vegas. I don't think I've ever played in a private game in Vegas. I've played some in L.A., um, but not a lot, like a very, very small, tiny percentage of my time spent as a uh, professional poker player. Yeah, no, because I think, I mean, there's the home game and then there's private games, right? The home game is just like your friends, you're hanging out, it's Friday night or Saturday, you got a game okay. on in the background and you're playing. But then the private game is like where there can be a lot more shady stuff happening because you don't know who's running the game. You know, like I've, I've heard Doug's rant about this where you don't, there's a lot of, there's a lot more ways you can get hurt, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, when there's when there's basically no security, the, the, the place, the, the regulations aren't in place that are there uh, from the gaming commission and uh you know that uh forces all these casinos to take various actions um there's cheating that can go down there's all sorts of stuff that it's it's a lot more it's higher risk it can, it can be high reward just because the uh the games are usually great you know they like i said they sort of maintain a list of you know we're only going to have a certain number of professionals in here and a lot of times it's like one or less so yeah the games can be great it can be high reward but it's also there's a lot of risks that uh, that go along with it. And it's also like extremely high rake a lot of the time. And that's something that like a lot of players don't really take into consideration. Um, but when the when the rake is really high, uh, everybody is making much less money. Um, you could still be a lot of the games, even even the, uh, even with a very high rake, um, depending on like just how good the game is. Um, but uh, that's another that's another big negative against a lot of the uh, private games or home games. Well, I guess those rules that you were talking about earlier uh, in terms of, like, anybody being able to sit down at a, at a table that's live, that goes back to, like, the issues they had during, like, the corporation days with, with Broil and, and all those guys when they were playing. They were they were putting their money together to, to play against the, the billionaire and stuff like that, and then people would come in and sit down and mess up the table. And I've heard Doug talk about stories where you try to sit down at a game with some big, and then they're, like, they started talking trash, and they just ended the game and stuff like that. Um, obviously, I... Um, I, I, like I said, I, I, I would. I, my, my dad's ninety-one now, so he doesn't go to casino. But I would take him to play tournaments at the at the local casinos here and stuff like that. And then I, I like to play. I'm the youngest person by like forty-five years at the Omaha High Low table. Uh, 
by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's me and a bunch of 75, 80 year olds are there. Um, do you have a favorite uh, variable for home games? Like I said, like the Seven Deuce, the the the, the Bomb Pots, uh, Sixth Street. What, the, what is there like a like a quirky sort of variable that you like to incorporate when you're playing with friends? I mean, I guess I I enjoy the uh, the PLO Bomb Pots um, for a couple of reasons. Um, they, they're a bunch of action. So whether it's single board or double board, uh, I'm a fan of of the action. And B because people are generally less studied in PLO. And uh, I've been trying to put in a little bit of work. So, I mean, it's, I don't know like how much edge there is when everyone's putting in money pretty flop and everyone has cards. There's still going to be a bunch of spots where there's just going to be a ton of variance that goes along with that. Um, but I feel like it's kind of fun. It's just fun for me to like try and put to, put to use some of those skills that I've been trying to trying to hone a little bit in PLO. But I also just like doing just, just flips. Like I just like dumb gambling sometimes, you know, because like poker can cards. be... Yeah, I mean, or you just like running it down, just like everyone gets yeah. dealt a hand, run the board out, and whoever wins wins, um, and everyone like throws in fifty bu- fifty dollars preflop or something like that. Um, you know, poker can be so like so you know thoughtful and strategic, and you know you're trying to like work your way through all these different hands. It's fun to just like it's a, it's a nice relief to just <laughs> toss the money in, and whoever wins wins. When um. I think one of the mistakes that that I make, I don't know if anybody else watching has made the same one, is that I watch a ton of poker content, right? I've always watched tons of poker content, um, you know, Red Books, you know, your videos, Brad videos, uh, Doug's videos, etc. So you sort of feel like, all right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm expanding my knowledge. And then you try to take that to your home game and somebody's calling you off with four seven because that's their favorite hand and then you know and they, they and, and they hit a vote. So you're like, there's games where there where 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 sometimes if you know a little too much about poker, you you bring too much to the table, right? Do you agree? Um, a lot of it is like it's it's uh it's about how you put that knowledge to work. Um, so you basically a lot of the stuff that like a very good poker player like Doug will try and teach is it's sort of like a baseline where you want to start. So when you hear about all this like game theory optimal stuff, you want to just you want to try and nail down the baseline as much as possible and figure out like what's the best sort of uh, without any other factors coming into play here, what's like the best way to approach the, the game of poker? What's the best theory here that I can start with? And then from that starting point, you want to You'll, you'll, you'll basically figure out how to adjust from that if you sort of have that very solid baseline based on like the other players at the table and what their tendencies are. So you can see that like this guy is doing something that is like so far away from the, the optimal theory of poker. And therefore, because he's doing that, I'm going to now stray in this direction in order to maximize my edge versus this guy and maximize what he's doing wrong for my benefit. So you basically want to start with like understanding the best way to approach the game and the theory of it, and then be able to use that against people when they don't really know or don't care so much about that stuff and are doing things that are so far away from that, that you know how to uh, make the best adjustments. And it, it can be pretty tough. It can be, it can for sure be frustrating because A, you have to like try and figure out how best to combat that. B, a lot of times it can require a lot of patience. And then C, even when you do all the correct things, you can still lose. And so that's that's pretty tough for uh, the human brain to sort of like rationalize and, and deal with a lot of the time. I think for and I'll use myself as a case, I think when I started to dive when, uh, when I started to dive past knowing the rules and what beats what it, it's it's I think the first kind of step is, oh, I have a, a flush draw. There's uh, there's seven cards left that, you know, I multiply by this and and, I, and that's the percentage that I have to, to win to, to hit my flush. Then you start thinking about pot odds and then you start thinking about, you know, uh, you know, implied odds and then your history with that person and what their opening ranges are. And and even that, I think, is where most casual players will stop yeah. or 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 after that, it becomes sort of. What do you mean blockers? Of course I have a 10, but there's three other 10s. What do you mean he can't have a 10? And 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 they're like, "Well, that just means that it that you there's a less of a chance that he has a 10." Yep. Or, you know, GTO or or removal and 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 stuff like that in sizing. Um 
is there a way to get those? And I think that you guys already do a great job of sort of making those topics more accessible to people. Um, do you feel that more can be done, or do you feel that 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 anything past that is just sort of holding people's hand through that process? I think that there is like such such a wealth of knowledge available um, to people now, and it's pretty easily found these days. Um, you know, to basically like to the level that people want to get into it. Um, so we have poker vlogs; they're all free on YouTube. Um, I think that's a pretty good starting point for people to like start their poker knowledge, poker study journey. Um, I don't think it's like the most efficient way to like get really good at poker. Um, you sort of you sort of get what you pay for a lot of times in the uh, in the poker knowledge streets. So you know you probably either want to join a training site or find a coach or get in all this solver stuff. But I mean, the cool thing about poker is that you don't have to enjoy it on only one particular level. You know, you can you can learn a little bit about st uh, about strategy or you can learn a lot or you can learn none of it and you can just splash around and gamble and have fun and uh, and have some drinks. And so there's there's the approach for basically any any level of, of player that wants to uh, that wants to get into it. So I think that there's like I think there's so much strategy stuff out there now that it's it's been like pushed about as far as it's as it seems like you, you always think it's going to get like you think yeah. it's as far as it'll go and then someone comes out with the next like theory that just blows everyone's mind or whatever but uh i think what's lacking in poker is more of like the sort of storytelling aspect of it and of course like again that's the stuff that i enjoy the most but you know that's like we used to have es we used to have the, the world series of poker on espn every year and like not even like just the main event but a lot of tournaments on espn and we used to have high stakes poker. And so like those two shows mainly used to be like a big driver for people to get into poker because they would see like these characters that ESPN would create and they'd do these cutaway backstories on these players. And, uh, you know, you, you learn about people like Sam Farhan and, and Phil Hellmuth and, and you see him like getting into verbal spats with Mike Mouth, Matisau, and you create all these characters out of this content. And it's like really compelling for people. And it's like, they can relate to these different characters and it's it's a story and people love stories so nowadays we have much less of that um it's like you know and some of it's a lot of it's behind paywalls so it's tougher for people to get into poker when when that's the case um and so of course i'm a little bit biased uh being a storyteller and putting his stuff out there for free um but you know i'm just, again like i'm just i'm just one dude who uh to this point basically never had an editor. I, sh I shoot it all myself and I upload it all myself and I film it all myself and all that stuff. And I feel like we've like done something that's pretty cool here for just like for one person. And you look at Brad's audience, it's like whatever, yeah, over three times, three times the size of mine. And like, look at the, like the numbers that he's reaching through this like storytelling mechanism. Um, so I think we need more of that stuff. Um, the streamers do a really good job of, you know, creating characters out of themselves and, having people get to know their story. Um, so I think like, of course, the, uh, the streamers and bloggers, I think do a fantastic job of that. And there's, you know, some podcasters as well that, uh, that are, that are really dope. Um, but yeah, I would like to see like more of that, more of that storytelling, more investment in storytelling from like an industry uh, uh, background. Maybe you guys could uh, like, if you have a huge hand against somebody, uh, maybe like, hit them up afterwards and just be like, hey, do you want to talk about that hand from your perspective? Maybe to add a little bit of the villain story to some of those blogs. I don't know if you or Brad ever did anything like that. I know sometimes they'll be, you'll be like, I talked to this guy afterwards and he said he had this or something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's actually funny. I did, uh, in that vlog that I did from Seven Mile, because, uh, oh, you yeah. know, I, I actually did exactly that. I, I found the guy, I found a guy, or not found him, but I took the, uh, one of my opponents that I played a hand against and uh, we each talked about the hand as I normally go through it, but like talked about some of his thoughts as we were going through it. Uh, but you're right, it should be, we should, I should like think about doing that sort of thing a little bit more often and have like recurring characters in the videos and, and stuff like that. Also shout out Upswing, which is the poker site that I've used for, for several years. I know uh, Brad and, oh, awesome. and you and, 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 and stuff uh, are, are, are in there as well. Um, and, um, I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit about um, why there's so few good poker movies. Because obviously, Rounders, 
right? That's that 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 in itself, and then and then you have like you know Maverick, right? And it's just yeah. like not the, the western, but it's also a cool poker movie. But the attempts to make the attempts to sort of even the the new movie, the Card Counter that came out, it has some poker elements in it. But it it it, it, it I don't know if you've seen it or else so I won't spoil it. I haven't seen it yet. But it, it does have some poker elements, but there are some stuff that 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 are kind of weird. Um, why do you feel it's so hard to to create a good poker movie? And Andrew, why are me and you the right people to make a poker movie? <laughs> <laughs> I think we might be. We might be the right people to make. A we got a movie. we got a location. Don't threaten me with a good time and having to fly out to Texas to film a poker movie at the lodge. Don't don't threaten me with that. That'd be, that'd be dope. I mean, yeah, we, we should we should expand the lodge and build out a proper just like film set in their studio or something of the sort. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I have a good answer for you on that one. But uh, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is that, um, you know, a lot of times a lot there's a lot of downtime in poker. You know, like if you're if you're playing a poker session, there's a lot of downtime. I mean, you you can feel that by like chatting with the other people at the table. And a lot of times there's like you're playing a session and you always see something new, you know. Or you meet a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, and it's there's, you know, there's there's often like something new and interesting that happens at the poker table, but there is a lot of downtime, so that it, it always has to get like sensationalized in the movie um, to fill in all that downtime, and it ends up being like pretty unrealistic. Um, yeah. Somehow rounders managed to like strike a really good balance. You know, they created a, the drama with the characters and the storyline and stuff like that without making the poker like just completely insane. Like you see some James Bond hands where someone slow yeah. rolls somebody with quads versus a straight flush versus a royal flush, whatever. And <laughs> yeah, that's supposed to be like, James Bond is so good. He woke up with four or five of spades and he hit a straight flush. What do you mean he's so good at poker? It was like the luckiest luck box hand of all time. And uh, how do you not know that the mad Russian has pocket aces there in rounders? Of course he's got the freaking aces. What else is he calling you down with on that board? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think there's not that many? What do you think there's not that many good poker movies? I think some of it is is the fact that the people making the movie don't understand that it, it, it has to be as much as the 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 action on the felt as well as uh, the the stories behind the players behind the villains and I think that that like I had I, I was looking at poker movies just kind of giving an idea runner runner all in lucky you casino royale uh, and, and 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 a lot of them, the poker scenes are the worst parts of it because it's like, oh, he folded queens, he folded kings to his dad's queens because he he wanted he loves his dad so much, and it's like, I love my dad more than anything, but I've been I've been at final tables at tournaments with him, and I'm fucking check raising him. I don't care. I know exactly how he plays, you know. So 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 there is there is that part. Let's see, Andrew's lagging here for a second. Are you still there, Andrew? Let's see. Did we lose Andrew? Andrew got frozen here. Let's see if he can let's see if he can refresh his stream for a second. We're live with Andrew Neem. Neemi, sorry. Uh talking poker, talking about the Loge Poker Room, Facebook.com slash two in burrito, YouTube, twitch.tv slash two in burrito, youtube.com slash two in burrito. Uh let's see if Andrew can rejoin us here in a second. Uh, thank you for everybody that has commented so far. Uh, we'll get to your question in a minute, uh, Vicky, as soon as uh, Andrew gets back in. And we'll wait a second to see if Mr. Nini is back with us momentarily. Okay, it looks like he left, and we'll get him back in a second. Hopefully, he can jump back in here. He's on that Phoenix Wi-Fi. Uh, Quick shout out here to our sponsors, Mestizo Coffee. As I mentioned before, you can get any of their merch. Uh, just put in the code Big Chief at checkout, and you can get ten percent off uh, on any merch or any coffee that they make. Also, shout out to the Lodge Poker Club in Austin, Texas, uh, where Mr. Andrew Nimi is going to be appearing live at the rest of this month um, with Doug Polk, Brad Owen, and Andrew Neem Battle on Stream Monday the 24th. And uh, also the biggest meetup game in history coming up here, 2-5 uh, meetup game on stream, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, there's Andrew. Yo, sorry about that. No, that's fine. That's fine. We were we, we took a chance to do the promotions there. Um, 
I forgot what we were saying. <laughs> Talking about poker movies, I mean, I think you're right. Um, people, a lot of times, you know, the producers might not have a, a true feel for like what goes on in the poker world. I think like, is it Brian Koppelman? Is that is that his name? That uh, I might have from from uh, Rounders. Rounders, yeah. He was yeah. one of the one of the writers. They spent like I don't know a year or maybe over a year just like hanging out in those card clubs in New York City and just hanging like, around. <laughs> yeah. Just like getting a feel for how people uh, talk about the game and writing all this stuff down. Yeah. Um, I thought Molly's game did a, did a pretty good job with like the LA home game scene and like telling the story of a bunch of those people that were involved. Mm -hmm. I, I dug it. I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if you agree. I, I enjoyed it. I'm not a huge Sorkin fan because his dialogue seems a little forced to me. Like people don't really mm -hmm. talk that way. And and sometimes even though he's brilliant in his writing, I think he gets repetitive. But Molly's game did do a, a good job. I mean, um, I think that just there's there's these other ones that are like, this is a poker movie, and it's just like, no, it's not. It's it's a weird movie, and you just jam poker into it. And 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 I don't and I don't think of it. I want rounders too, you know, but 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 they're they've been this little um a little slow on that one. If yeah. uh if you could uh if you could um have one of these if if you could have one of these two things uh, tomorrow which one would you prefer a world series of poker bracelet in pot limit omaha or 1 million youtube subscribers <laughs> uh i would take the million the million youtube subscribers yeah <laughs> yeah i would take the, the subscribers um a i would i would easily be able to generate more revenue than first place in that plo bracelet event um b it's just like it's just what i've devoted like way more energy to uh like especially recently you know i've been i've been i guess poker player for a greater number of years than i have been a content creator um but i don't know like i don't at least not anytime soon i won't go back to like just being a poker player um i'm going to continue to play this role for like you know the foreseeable future um so that's like that's for sure where, where all the energy has been recently, where it's going, and uh, I'll get the I'll get the bracelet eventually if I if I try hard enough. I and I've and it's not a goal unless you say it out loud or write it down. And my goal is to be the first person to win a World Series of Poker bracelet and win an Oscar. That's that's my life goal. So I hasn't I, happened yet, huh? Uh, not 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 yet, not yet. I was going actually. I was sick. I got sick before the World Series of Poker. I was going to go play two events. I was going to play like a uh, event number 44, which was a PLO and then a $1,500 um, a turbo or something. And because I, I was going to be there those days and I was like, fuck it, this is a I'm going to I'm going to throw my my. But then I, I got a little sick before then. And uh, the doctor was like, where you? Uh, I was like, hey, I, I, he's like, you got to take these antibiotics. You got to do this. And, and I was like, well, I was going to go to Vegas and sit 15 hours at a poker table. And he's like, no, don't do that. And yeah. he's like, the rest of the time I was going to be in the pool in the jacuzzi. He's like, don't go to a pool or jacuzzi in Las Vegas. You know, anyway, that's just not a good idea for your health. So I was like, all right, okay. no. but I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm going to be there next year for a couple of events. Um, there's this new wave of like poker. Okay. Well, here's a, here, here's a lead up to that. Is poker vlogger now a type of player that you need to watch out for at the tables, like old man coffee or grizzled euro or like young guy with the headphones, the hoodie and the glasses? It has has poker vlogger become a meme in terms of in terms of the, the person you got to you got to be careful for if you sit down at the table and I see a guy and he's got his phone out and he's ready. Well, what do you mean? Be careful about well, you know, old man coffee, he's, 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 he's folding 90% of his hands. He's, okay. he's raising you with the nuts. You know, the Euro guys is, is doing crazy stuff with like do seven offsuit, you know, is, is there a, <laughs> is there a, is there a poker vlogger style? Should I be worried that they're like, okay, this guy. And, and I think, no, we talked about this earlier where people might think that you're doing things for the vlog and stuff like that. But, but has, is there a type of player that a poker vlogger is these days? Um, I think I think the average poker vlogger uh, puts in some work on their game, but I don't think they're going to be the toughest reg in in that stake. You know, um, just because like we we talked a little bit about this before, but they're putting so much energy into this poker vlogging thing um, that they're not going to be like the most studious poker student because they don't have the time or energy to do that. Um, so like the best poker players. They're, you know, they're, they're watching videos on training sites. They're running Sims. They're talking about poker hands with friends. Um, a lot of these things are replaced by 
you know, watching YouTube videos, how to edit, how to use this editing tool, uh, talking with other content creators about the way YouTube works, um, figuring out how to use this camera setting. So it's just, it's just time and energy spent into something that isn't poker study. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's the spectrum of, you know, poker player, poker vloggers who put more work, work in than others. Um, shout out to Mariano poker. I think he's probably like the, the best poker player who's a poker vlogger, um, or at least will be if he's not already, because he's like, he enjoys like the studying more than anything. Um, he, he like would probably, he would, if you asked him the bracelet versus subscribers question, he would take the bracelet, I think, or maybe not bracelet, but you know, like if he was, if you asked him if he wanted to be a successful high stakes reg versus uh, a million subs, I think he would go with the, uh, the successful high stakes reg. Um, so, you know, there's like, there's various people fall uh, in various, uh, sections of that, that spectrum. No, not quite. Now, what if I raise the poker bracelet to main event bracelet versus 5 million YouTube subscribers? <laughs> uh, main event bracelet versus 5 million subs. That's a pretty tough question because I think first place is 8 million. Yeah. Um, with five million subs, you can generate that in a few, two, three years, right? Four years. Five years. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> but 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 if you win a World Series of Poker made of a bracelet and you put out the vlog next day, you might hit five million subscribers just naturally, right? You would get a lot of subscriptions <laughs> based on that one vlog. Based on the vlog, how I won eight million dollars. Yeah, uh, man, it's really tough. I mean, I don't know. It's it's interesting because I don't really know. I wonder like what the. Uh, I mean, I. I I don't know if there's like diminishing returns at some point with this like YouTube thing when you get to like 2 million subs versus 5 million subs, or if it's just like just a, a smooth ramp towards, towards riches, YouTube riches. I don't know. It's really close. I guess I'd flip a coin on that one. Flip a coin. And then when it's in the air, you know, which one you're, you're really hoping it lands on, right? <laughs> um, what about you? What about you? Main <clears throat> event or Oscar? Oof, man. If I, if it's the main event, the main event. If it's like a fifteen hundred dollar PLO or 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 six max, then probably the Oscar. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd I'll take that first. You know, maybe I'll even take a regional Emmy in a fifteen hundred dollar. Uh, yeah, so. I mean the main event. The main event is just like bam, you have the lump sum right there. I mean, I guess you got to pay taxes too, but you got the lump sum. With the uh, subscribers, you still got to put out a little. You got to do a bunch of work still to uh, generate yeah. that uh, the coin off of it. The main event, but you sold seventy five percent of yourself. <laughs> yeah, then I guess the subs. <laughs> the subs. All right, uh, we're almost done. We're talking live with Andrew Nimi here, OG poker vlogger and new owner of the Lodge Poker Club in Austin, Texas, where there is a uh, bustling new uh, poker scene. Well, I mean, it's right there. It was right there in the name all the way along, Texas Hold'em. We didn't see it. How did we not see it? <laughs> um, and and you guys can go. Uh, Go to the Lodge and, and 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 check him out because there's going to be a ton of meetup games, a ton of content coming, um, and 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 I'm and I look forward to it. Uh, you know, I look forward hopefully in the next few months, hopefully to be able to take a trip out there, um, and, and check some of the the new tables out. And um, and 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 there's a lot of the stuff that you guys are going to do. Is that all stuff that that you guys sat and you you Doug Brad and the rest of the team sat down and we're like. Let's add this. Let's add this. The, I mean, obviously, you guys are are are, are going to jumpstart this with all these monster events that are that are happening this month. Um, but but I guess you guys are really making a full effort to just start off strong because obviously, when you say Doug, Brad, and Andrew are opening up a poker room or are partnering with a poker room, people in the community are going to be like, "I got to go check that out." Yeah, we're taking it. We're taking it seriously. You know, it's. I, I wish I could uh, show you like the Telegram chats. We've we've built out like now we're up to like five or six different Telegram chat groups with different sections of of people that are working at the lodge. You know, so there's like the management, then there's like guys that work on the stream, then there's the you know guys that are uh, doing the promotional stuff that like the team Upswing is working on. Um, so. We are all taking it like super seriously. There was months of meetings and Zoom calls that happened before the announcement where we were trying to figure out this thing and like making sure everyone was happy with the deal and, and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, we don't want to just like just do something. And then if it works out, if it works out, if it doesn't, then whatever, we'll just move on. Like, I don't think that's I don't think that's this kind of a group, um, especially if you look at a guy like Doug, you know, like he when he does something, he wants to 
he wants to do it right. You know, he's he got into he got into poker. He you know everyone struggles for for some time, but he made his way all the way to the top and uh, to the point where like people didn't want to play him in heads up. Um, and so it's like he's the kind of guy that just like when he does something, that's 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 how he approaches it. And uh, we don't really want to have like you know. Uh, a black eye on our resume for something that we sort of like half-assed with. You know, we want to do want to do it right. We want to make make people uh, make people happy and like be excited about this sort of thing. And especially like because there's employees that work there, and we don't want to just like you know take something that they were uh, really happy with before we arrived, and then they you know become frustrated with it for whatever reason or, or what have you. So we definitely want to do it right. Uh, for lack of a less corny term, you guys are all in. Sorry. Indeed. I, could, Indeed. I, I, I couldn't help myself. All right. So I have a bit for you here. Uh, what kind you're a you're a fan of the of the of the of the hoppy beers. I, I've seen you uh, on stream afterwards. You always kind of have a couple during the meetup games or you have one. I, one of the favorite part, one of the favorite blogs that you did recently at Christmas where you you went and you won some money and then you were tipping two, three hundred bucks here and there at different at different spots. I love that. That was that was that was a real generous uh, move on your part. Um, I'm going to give you a poker player. You tell me what kind kind of beer they are right <laughs> oh man we'll start off with an easy one doyle brunson there are correct answers to this oh there are correct answers to this yeah yeah i mean there's ones that i thought about let's see if we match uh <laughs> i mean i i sort of i guess like something like a porter or a stout comes to mind uh, doyle brunson is a budweiser because he's the king of beers see that's it that's, that's, that's you should be doing beer. i can already tell you should be doing this segment by yourself i, I <laughs> All right, Dan Bilzerian. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> give me a second here. All right, just hit me with your joke. Let's hear it. <laughs> Dan Bilzerian is a shitty IPA that your friend brews in his, in his backyard. Sorry. Um, Doug Polk. That's an easy one, too. This is an easy one, huh? <laughs> yeah, Doug Polk. Easy. You tell me. You tell me. <laughs> Duck Polk is a white claw. <laughs> oh, Duck Duck Polk could definitely get a sponsorship for white claw. All right, Negranu, Negranu, think Canadian. Think Canadian. Okay, uh, Labatt Blue. Yes, correct. Labatt nice. Blue, absolutely. Um, Phil Ivy. I don't have an answer for this one. Phil Ivy. I mean, you could you could just like do like some sort of a pun where it's like pills pills Ivy or something like that. Pills Pilsner. Pilsner. I don't know. Uh, all right, all right, all right. I was I was just trying to have a little fun there. Um, what is your go-to? What's what's your go-to beer? Like I, I'm a Rolling Rock man. I like a little Stella once in a while. You know, I, really? I know you have the Heaven Weiser once in a while. What what's your what's your go-to libation? Uh, for a long time, I like this. Uh, I like the Belgian beers for a long time. Um, there's this one called Saint Bernardus, and it's the ABT12. So it sounds a little fancy. Maybe it is a little fancy, but really good one. Um, you know what's crazy is like there's so many like breweries, microbreweries all over the country now, and, and like I don't even know if it makes sense to have a favorite beer because there's just so much good stuff now. Like even in Las Vegas, where there was kind of like a big emptiness of breweries, I think for a long time. If you go to Main Street in the Arts District, there's several that are there now. Um, so if you go to Abel Baker, they have a bunch of good stuff there. Uh, if you go to Nevada Brew Works on Main Street, a bunch of good stuff there. And there's this other spot called Cerveza, which is not a brewery, but it's a tap room and bottle shop, they call it. They have, like, this walk-in fridge where they probably have, like, I don't know, several hundred beers to choose from. You can have them there, take them to go. Tough to go wrong. If you, uh, if, I mean, if you ever just get into a brewery drought, San Diego's got, like, a billion of them. They're, they're, they're just, they're all over the place here. Yeah, yes. Uh, I think Ballast Point is one of them. Ballast Point, yeah. Like there's that. a ton. And there's, there's a lot of local ones that make like these, they make like these weird hibiscus beers and, and Mexican themed beers. There's a lot of, there's a lot of real cool stuff. One other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, that there was a, a Poppy GTO cameo at the end of your video too. And obviously everybody's like, Hey, where's Poppy GTO? He, yeah. his, his, his content, uh, during the Mike Postle thing and during the Negrano Polk stuff was, was legendary. And obviously, you know, we wish him the best and stuff like that. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, the content that he created and sort of the lane he fills in poker? It's it's interesting because he's like, he's so uh, irreplaceable, basically. Like, 
there's nobody that you can like if you look at like me and brad i feel like there's a lot of similarities between me and brad granted you know i do i do a little bit uh different you know film work film film creation work than he does and definitely have different styles and stuff but you know there's also like a lot of similarities between the two of us if you look at uh joe ingram um there's nobody that's like joe ingram in in poker uh so um, we were talking a little bit on Doug's podcast about like all the, all the uh, work he did promoting pot limit Omaha. Um, and like, who knows how many people he got to at least try the game, um, just based on him alone. Uh, and yeah, all the, uh, investigation stuff that he did, um, without any additional resources and just like that super energetic personality, um, pretty, pretty irreplaceable dude. Um, I did. Yeah, it does. It seems like he's doing all right. Um, I didn't, uh, you know, I don't have regular long chats with him or anything, but I uh, ran into him on the streets there in downtown Las Vegas. And uh, he's he seems to be enjoying just kind of learning about uh, cryptocurrency and how, how big of a, a game that that is at the, at the moment and probably will be for as, as long as we're around. I think one of the things that, that that's that's the most sustainable about cryptocurrency is is how poker and gambling in that world really just sort of needs it you know, for, for like, it's like ecosystem, you know, like there's a, there's a, there's a huge crossover between um, gambling, sports gambling, you know, online poker, stuff like that with the crypto as well. So there's, I mean, I think- people, people love gambling, you know, it goes, it goes back to like what we were talking about earlier in the, in the, in the podcast about like how we, we sort of like used to think about gambling as this sort of underground thing that only, only shady people partook in and couldn't really talk about it publicly, but like people love it. And like sports betting is now it's rolling out on a, on a regulated basis all across the country. And uh, you know, like the markets are just another form of gambling. Basically it's just speculation. Um, you know, you can try and educate yourself on, on different things, try and find an edge, but there's so many parallels in, uh, in all that stuff. And, we're uh, we're a gambling people. We in, we enjoy it, and um, it definitely yeah. fuels a lot of that. We love to put some money up. It makes it more fun. Um, yep. One last thing I wanted to ask you before we get to our our final bracket bit here for the day. Um, I have seen the rise of some sort of like YouTube Shorts, TikTok vloggers, and the, you know they're they're basically condensing what you do into like a 30, 45 second clip. Some of their content is it feels like they're shitting on on on, on you guys a little bit, kind of like you know, like they're just sort of parodying you or something like that. And <laughs> I followed a couple, but I did not like. I said, if you come at, if you come at the king, you best not miss. You know, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you? Uh, how do you? Do you feel like? Uh, do you feel like that's like an homage? Do you feel a little insulted? How does that make you feel that there are these young guys that obviously have seen tons of your videos? because they reference it, but they're also yeah. sort of like nudging you and like, oh man, get out the way, stop, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't, I guess I never really, uh, never really felt that, but now that you said, I'm going to be very paranoid about it. No. Um, I think that they're just, they're just trying to, uh, I think they're just trying to leverage a platform that is possibly like the next, the next big thing, you know, like TikTok is obviously the next big thing or has been the, the big thing now for a little while. And uh, these platforms are trying to, push creators in that direction a little bit, you know, like YouTube is trying to get creators to use their, their shorts platform to, uh, to rival TikTok or at least slow the bleed for, from YouTube to TikTok. And you can generate a shitload of views by using these platforms as a result of that. Um, and people like to, you know, just watch one after the other. So I think they're just trying to, just trying to use the tools that are available and uh, just trying to grow their channels as much as possible. I don't think it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought it was something that was like done out of spite or or uh, a dig or or anything like that, unless I, unless I'm missing something in particular. No, I, I think it's just kind of. I think it's fun, but but you know they're like uh, they're they're basically doing a condensed version of one of your blogs and then just yeah. sort of making fun, like oh you know. I call it in, and old man coffee moves in, and then I got my triple nuts, and they got the double nuts, and then they suck out on me, and it's and it's like you know, yeah, yeah, you can say that's what happens in a, in an Andrew Nimi or, or or a Brad video, but there's a lot more work that goes into it, so you know. But I understand, and then all of a sudden you get maybe you know a couple hundred thousand views on a video, and they get like nine million views on a TikTok video, so it's just kind of like, yeah. man, you know, that's all right. Yeah, that stuff is interesting. <laughs> that stuff is interesting. It's like it's like the uh, the, the revenue isn't there if you want to like you know, get into the nuts and bolts of it. Like the revenue isn't there for those things, but they can be like a really good tool for uh, channel growth. So maybe it's worth doing, but I mean, for me, it's like, 
I go back and forth between like trying to play the YouTube game or trying to play like the happiness game and like the creativity game. And uh, like, I definitely started out with the, uh, the creativity game. Um, and then at some point I really like, I think got a little bit lost in the weeds of like just trying to play the YouTube game and just trying to maximize views and shied away from the creative stuff a little bit. Um, but I want to try and get back into the creative stuff and also like try and uh, like help somebody else who wants to maybe work with me. Um, you know, started looking for an editor. So uh, try and maximize their, uh, their input and work together with somebody to keep the uh, creative juices flowing on the channel. Well, once you get to a million views, you know, you let me know and I'll load up the truck and I'll head out to, I'll head out Texas way when you need like nice. four, four editors and another, and we start talking about that poker movie that we're going to shoot out there. Create a real, uh, <laughs> create a real machine here. A real, a real machine. Um, that being said, we're going to get to our final bit. Mr. Andrew Neem, you are a poker pro. You have been in the industry for five years blogging about things, but more, probably more than that. 2016 is when you started, right? So probably about five years now. Uh, but you've been in the poker streets for the last 15 or so years. Uh, and we're going to get to a segment that I like to call the bracket bit. Nice. Mr. Neem, we've gotten to the end of our interview, which means I no longer have to focus, which means I can light up my joint. And we can get to the final we to the final segment of our show. Since you are a poker pro, the bracket bit is a this or that concept where I'm going to give you two different items and you tell me which moves on. Whatever methodology you want to use to solve the bracket bit is up to you. Okay. So when I give you this, what I've chosen is a poker player showdown. So I'm going to give you two poker players and you can tell me which one you think is the better player, which one you think you would rather have play for you heads up if it was like a heads up match for your life or which one you think would be a better poker vlogger whatever methodology you want to solve this bracket is up to you i create it you solve it are you ready i am ready all right so let's go poker player madness all right we got doyle the master versus dan harrington doyle no doyle, doubt who's that? no doubt doyle. i mean he's the number one seed for a reason here we talked about sports betting before we got Liv Bury or dan smith um so Liv definitely brought like a lot of uh you know, fun and energy to the uh, poker streets. And she, she definitely gets like the whole, uh, I think the media side of things. Um, but I think she has since left us in the poker world. And she's Dan's not onto like around. metaphysical stuff, right? No, no, no. no. She's, uh, she's on to other, <laughs> on to other uh, pursuits. <laughs> so uh, Dan Smith is going to move on here. All right. Brent Kenny or Barry Greenstein, Ace on the River. Uh, Let's go. Let's go old school, Mister Mister Wisdom Barry Greenstein here. Uh, was your was uh, Super System or Ace on the River? What was your first poker book that you read? Uh, Super System. Yeah, that was that was the first one. That's kind of like the must. All right, we got Justin Bonomo because I couldn't picture a, a guy a scarier guy to sit across from if I was at a final table, <laughs> or Scotty. Went. Tough, tough call here. Um... Let's new school let's... versus old school crazy kind of style. Exactly, yeah. You call is gonna be all over, baby. <laughs> let's let's move him on. Let's let's bring Scotty along with us. Let's bring Scotty. He's more fun. He's got the corona in hand. He's moving to the second round. Let's uh, go. Michelob is Scotty. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's right. The Michelob. Who's the corona? Corona is uh I don't know, somebody corona's probably uh, I'm not sure actually. All right, Maria Ho or Dan Bilzer? Uh, let's uh let's bring Maria home. Maria's in. Uh, also, you know, she's a top-notch commentator as well. You know, she brings a lot of a, a lot of a lot of that. She, uh, she gets it. She gets it. Uh, Johnny Moss or Annie Duke? A couple of classics here. Uh, you know, I don't know if you I don't know if you've heard, but uh, Annie isn't. There's not. A, it's it's kind of like 
not the best light that she's uh, shining on, on on poker or shining on her, I should say. Oh no, um, no! Has she been canceled? Has she been poker canceled? She has. She has been poker canceled. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, what's interesting is that I don't really know too much about Johnny Moss and the and the history uh, of him, but it's it's with with her. Unfortunately, it's just a uh, it's, it's just an immediate uh, disqualification. So Johnny Moss, it is. All right, let's get her out of the let's get her out of the loop then. Uh, you know who I would <clears throat> who I uh, I would replace her with um, is the uh, oh my god. Now you know what? Let's 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 go on the fly because he's uh, my favorite commentator. Let's put in Nick Schulman here instead All right, of uh, well, well. Now we're gonna have to change our answer because uh, Nick Schulman is probably the coolest guy in poker, one of so. Nick yeah, let's is get in. let's get Nick Schulman in there because he's the OG. He's from New York. He's like the favorite. Slides right in. Fuck, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's smooth as butter on those on that. <laughs> All right, we got Negrano versus Jason Mercier. Uh, Negrano was probably my, I think either him or Antonio Spandiari was like my my OG sort of like poker man crush kind of a thing. So we'll, we'll let uh, Negrano in here. All right, Tony G or Phil Ivey. Ooh, this is a tough battle here. Um, obviously, like for very uh, different reasons, they they bring entertainment uh, to the poker streets. Um, Tony G is like that guy that you love having at your home game because he's going to be spewy and make a lot of stuff, but then he, he ends up taking like two, three hundred bucks off you and like fuck. <laughs> Let's bring Tony G in there, Phil Ivy, out of their first round. I, oh man, big upset round one. That was a uh, that, that was a tough one. Yeah, you, you you're probably laying like four to one on Phil in that case, right? Uh, Amarillo Slim or Patrick Antonius? Uh, I think uh, I think Patrick is going to be uh, joining us here in round two. All right, Jennifer Harmon or Tom Duan? Um, let's go with. We'll go. We'll go old school here. We'll go. We'll bring Jennifer Harmon in here. Did you ever uh, uh, find yourself up against her in the old uh, online streets back in the day, or is that not really your time? Uh, I think we were in different universe uh, in terms of stakes. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was playing those uh, La- Beta Lambo on the turn, Beta Lambo on the river, right? Those those yeah. kind of games. Uh, okay, uh, Stu Unger or Mike the Mouth? Uh, sorry, Mikey. We're gonna go with the legend here, Stu Unger. All right, Chris Moneymaker or uh, Greg Raymer, two of the original from the poker boom. Yeah. The, the Fossil Man or Moneymaker, who made a run this year, who made a run, la- I mean, last year. Yeah. Uh, I've met both of these guys, both of them super nice guys. Greg is still out there, like, on the grind, like, on the uh, on the tour. Uh, Chris Moneymaker, also uh, still out there in the streets. He plays a lot online as well. Uh, spent a little bit more time with Chris, so I'm going to go with Chris Moneymaker. Moneymaker. Johnny Chan or Eric Seidel? Uh, let's go with Eric Seidel only because, well, okay. Yeah. Eric Seidel, <laughs> uh, Vanessa Polk or Steven Chidwick. <laughs> <laughs> they're playing as a tag team in this, in this tournament. They're playing as, yeah, they're playing tough as to, one uh, tough to, uh, <laughs> decline that tag team power. So Vanessa Polk it is. Vanessa Polk it moves on, uh, Antonio or Fedor. Another guy who just basically made, just wrecked it, and then said, "All right, I'm moving on to other things." Yeah, he said that, but he's still hanging around as well. But uh, yeah, Antonio is the other guy who uh, sort of like really got me into poker as well. So Antonio is in. All right, and then Jamie Gold or Phil Helmuth. Duh. Again, two uh, two very entertaining people to watch. Um, but we will uh, we will bring Mr. Helmuth in, into round two. Jamie, I mean. I don't know if you can do the I'm honest about every hand that I have technique, you know, because I think people will eventually catch on. I think in, 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 he caught lightning in a bottle that year where it was like he had this style that worked that year with those players and, and, and he and he wrote it, you know? Yeah, it was a pretty uh, pretty sweet combination of, uh, of that stuff and, and running good all at the right time. And uh, that was that was pretty magical. I got a Helmuth question for you. I know he's obviously every player that isn't a pro has the daydream of how they would respond to Phil Helmuth talking. Sh- like I was like, oh, I'm going to be at the table with Hel- Phil Helmuth and he's going to say some shit because I called him down with something and I'm going to say this to him. Um, 
why does he get such a pass on, on some of that behavior? Is he just is he that important to the game, or 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 is he or does he let everybody know, hey, this is the character, but this is me? He shouldn't. He shouldn't get a pass. Um, he's. I mean, he's definitely. He's definitely entertaining a lot of the time, um, and he also gets like a lot of the media stuff. Um, but he. He's sort of a product of like. Um, I mean, he's passionate about the game and he's good at the game, but he's sort of like. He's so prevalent because of what we we're talking about before. How there's not really as much of a machine in place to build up and create and put a spotlight on characters these days in the poker world. So he's a product of the, of the, you know, the previous generations where he's still super passionate about the game and he manages his money really well and he stays in action and he's also a really good player. Um, and he understands that you need to make for an entertain, entertaining uh, show. So he's, he's all those things, but he's there so much and he gets away with so much because we have this sort of like void of, of characters that uh, can also get, get good uh, camera time. And I mean, this got divided, this got decided on the felt recently on poker go and, and poker go, I mean, you need to figure out some other way to make money than the po than the paywall. In my opinion, I mean, I don't know about other people, but I subscribe to poker go when the world series starts and I unsubscribe when it ends. <laughs> and because I have to, because I want to watch the World Series, the rest yeah. of the content that they have out there, Poker After Dark, that stuff is good. I mean, all that, some of that stuff is good, but, but for me to pay ten, twelve, fifteen bucks a month in in the off season, by the off season, I mean non World Series of Poker, I gotta have more, or I gotta, I, 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 I gotta, or you gotta like maybe charge me more for the World Series month and only charge a couple of bucks a month for the other one. But 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 there's some do you feel that there's there's there, they need to tweak that model? I mean, I hear you for sure. I mean, you're talking to a guy who gives everything away for free on YouTube and uh, figures out a different way to to make a living. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's great to uh, have all the uh, all the good stuff behind a paywall. Um, you know, your your most passionate uh, poker fans are going to are going to be willing to pay for it. But I don't think it's great for the uh, the growth of the, the industry. All right. Antonio versus Phil. Antonio versus Phil. Uh, man, I mean, I'm definitely more of an Antonio fan, but uh, Helmuth whacked him pretty good in this heads yeah. up uh, duel thing three times in a row. Three times. But uh, I guess out of like uh, feeling bad for Antonio and, and still uh, <laughs> digging him, I'm going to go with Antonio anyway. All right. Well, this will hopefully breed a. Uh, 18 tweet rant from Helmuth on Twitter later. <laughs> How dare that big fat burrito guy or Andrew not pass me past the second round. I'm the greatest. The last seven times I played micro stakes, I won $85. I don't know. He, he does one of his favorite rents. All right. Eric Seidel or Vanessa Polk? <laughs> all right. We're going to put this Vanessa Polk to bed. Eric's moving on. <laughs> all right. All right. Sorry. 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 He even does it himself. You know, I mean, shout out Doug. He's a he's a supreme leader. He's a go. I, I absorb every single one of his videos. You know, yeah, he, he and he's, he gets he's, a kick out of that. He's he's an ultimate. You know, he's he's a brilliant poker player. He's a brilliant troll. He's a brilliant marketer. And 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 by any measure, he's he's one of the most important figures in poker uh, in the modern poker scene because of you know, like I said, you know, Doug Polk's opening a poker room in in Texas. That's going to drive numbers right away. You add you and Brad and the rest of the team and an established brand and, and some creative juice to, to your streams and stuff like that. It's, I think I, I'm pretty sure, I know you guys took a while to get to it, but I'm pretty sure it was like, yeah, I, pretty sure this is going to be something that we want to do. Um, Stu, so uh, shout out Doug, uh, Stu Unger or Moneymaker? Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to keep the, uh, the Stu Unger uh, legend rolling along here. Patrick Antonius or Jennifer Harmon? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I've, I've always been a big Jennifer fan, but uh, Patrick, just just too good, just too cool, you know? He's too got ice. Of a man. He's, he's, he's ice. He's just like, he's just ice cold, man. Just like, yep. even when he's making bad moves, you're just like, oh, yeah, I know why he's doing that. Uh, this battle happened a lot in the uh, old school poker streets, Negrano and Tony G. Uh, let's go with, let's go with Negrano here. Sorry, Maria, Tony. And the battle of the broadcast team, Maria Ho, Nick Schulman. Yeah. Uh, both really cool people. It seems like, um, 
I agree with you. My favorite uh, broadcast, my favorite commentator as well, Nick Shulman. Moving on. Nick Shulman is the poker player I'd most like to smoke a blunt with. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Barry Greenstein or Scotty? Let's keep Barry G in there. Ace on the river. Keep it Ace on the river. Doyle or Dan? Doyle moves on. All right, we got the we're getting here. Sweet sixteen time. I mean, final eight time. Doyle or Barry is a tough one. Tough bow here. Probably Classic. the two the, the two most important. Would you say that right? The two most important poker books. Could be. Yeah, I read that. I read Ace on the River a long time ago. It'd be interesting to look back on it or read through it again. Um, I think we uh, I think we keep Doyle going here. Keep him going. Keep him going. Keep it going. And then Shulman and Negranu. Shulman versus Negranu. Uh, Different, uh, different, kind of different types of people. One definitely a little bit more energetic than the other one. One, Nick, a little bit more cool cat kind of a guy. I like that style. Let's let's move Nick Shulman into the next Nick, round. Nick Shulman making it to the top four when he wasn't even in the original lineup. That's that's. <laughs> that, that. <laughs> and honestly, that was a I know an omission on my part because Nick is one of my favorite people to listen to talk about poker, <laughs> and and uh, I can I can I can listen to him talking about poker without seeing what's on the screen and completely. We won't tell him that uh, Andy Duke was in there. Yeah, we won't tell him. We won't tell him that it was uh, that's that never happened. That was uh, that was a typo. Uh, <laughs> and then the other side, we in the other uh, uh, elite eight here, we got Antonius or Stu. This is a pretty sick battle right here, um, but. Yeah, that's, I'd love to see any of these battles heads up at some point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, something we can't have, obviously. But all right, let's keep Stu going. Patrick's all right. It. Yeah, Patrick's all right. Is right. And then Eric Seidel or Antonio? Uh, I think Eric is uh, is just too good here. I think uh, we're gonna move Eric into the next one. All right. Here's our final four: Doyle, Shulman, Stu, and Eric Seidel. Doyle versus Nick Shulman. I mean, Nick had a good run. Pretty compelling, uh, pretty compelling matchup here, but Doyle moves on. And then Stu or Eric? Yeah, this is also a. Uh, I mean, a lot of people pay a lot of money to uh, to watch this uh, this match go down. Um, yeah, you could flip a coin on this one here, but uh, let's uh, let's have a pretty epic uh, final two here with Stu and Doyle. All right, which one of these two, uh, if they had a poker vlog in like 1965, which one would you have rather watched? Oh man, <laughs> yeah, this you can make two like awesome movies right there. Um, it's me, know, Texas Doyle. Dolly, and I was playing 400, 800. At yeah, Minions. like all the all the wild, like the le- like the legit Wild West stuff, and then Stu out there. And, Frank Sinatra uh, sat down at the table. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, I think we're gonna give the uh, the crown to the, uh, the ultimate legend Doyle Brunson here. Doyle Brunson, Stu Ungar, another. I mean, these were the top two seeds. Number one. I mean, overall, if you're talking about legends of the game, those are it. But I was, no... I was a little uh, unsure about some of my early picks, uh, especially like Tony G versus Phil Ivey. That was an interesting round. But I'm glad. I'm, I, I like the way this uh, played out in the end here. Now. Um... What what do you think the I mean I didn't want to put you or, or Brad in there obviously but um uh, do, what do you think the biggest omission to this list was if there was a poker player they were like oh I I don't I didn't see him I thought that or she was going to be there um I guess maybe someone like uh, Bobby Baldwin you know because he he used to uh, he used to run in those same streets with uh, or Chip Reese as well you know that's another guy um, those guys used to run on the same streets with Doyle and everything and then Bobby became this uh um he, he started working in the uh, casino industry and has done really well for himself uh, on that side of things so interesting interesting career there for sure all right well mr uh andrew nimi uh i appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us today man uh everybody that's in texas or has a chance to get to texas go check out uh all these meetup games uh monster games uh yeah this is going to be a super fun super fun week we're gonna kick it off that live stream on, on monday then we're gonna try and have that uh massive meetup game on tuesday um or we are gonna have that massive meetup game on tuesday and then the entire week is just gonna be really fun with all of us at the same time absolutely man and uh can uh one last thing i would like to ask you would you mind doing a uh, a promo for us just a, a read for us okay just uh I'll, i'm gonna put you on the full screen just say you're uh you're watching fireside chats with uh or i'm andrew nimi and i'm watching fireside chats with with big chief burrito fireside chats with big chief all right you got it all right you ready yes 
What's up, guys? I'm Andrew Nimi, and you're watching Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito. There you go, brother. I appreciate you taking the time uh, today, man. Um, you're, you're a super. I mean, you're you're incredibly successful. You're an OG in in, in the poker blogging streets. We wish you nothing but success in the. Um, it, it, you know, with the lot uh, with the lodge coming up, and um, and and you're super humble as well. And I and I was like, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna shoot my shot, invite Andrew on the podcast, and you're like, I'd love to, absolutely. And I was like, I had to stand up. I was like, Hey, I got Andrew Dean for the podcast. I did a little dance. I was like, Oh my god, this is fucking awesome. Yeah, this is really fun. I saw your uh, I saw your YouTube videos when you're talking about like, uh, you know, talking about filmmaking in in general and talking about the uh, homage. Thing and, and stuff and uh just to chat about uh filmmaking with somebody who like is more talented and understands it more than i do is uh is a treat for me so i enjoy it no absolutely we focus more on the on the poker stuff obviously because you know i think people that's what people want to hear but but do you have like a like a favorite uh non-poker movie or like a favorite director or, or like a like a major genre that you're into the most I don't know. I don't know if i have like number one favorite I've, i'm recently uh right now i'm re-watching breaking bad Okay. Um, nice. Love that stuff. Um, I really like uh, the movie Sicario. Um, okay. I like Quentin Tarantino stuff a lot. Um, Would you like like the glasses, like Heat stuff, like that? Like yeah, uh, it was awesome. Yeah, some modern western. Like, uh, do you watch Better Call Saul too? I haven't seen any of that yet, so maybe I'll fire that up. Is that as good or remotely as good? It had. I think it's. If you talk about like the impact, it's it's probably about eighty five percent of Breaking Bad, just because Breaking Bad has a much faster pace, especially when you're binging it. Uh, Better Call Saul is incredibly high quality, but it's more of a slower burn. That's cool but with it, me. It, it it does build up that universe. So I would suggest finish Breaking Bad and then watch Better Call Saul uh, as the last season. I always like that. Even when there's a show that I haven't watched, but I know the final season's coming out, I'm like, okay, now's the time to, to binge it so that I'm so that I'm caught up, man. Yeah. All right. I'm going to do it. I'll, I'll definitely take your word for it and I'll check it out. All right, man. And like I said, uh, you are a frustrated filmmaker at heart. So once you guys get settled in on this transition to Austin and you open up the Lodge, studio, the Lodge Studios and we, we're going to make that poker movie, I want to get in that mix, right? You are you are there. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, everybody, that tuned in, asked questions. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to be back in 30 seconds after I hit this clip. But thank Sounds you, good. everybody, for, for checking in. Peace out.